implementation of uh, like saving a document. So MongoDB has so many, it's really rich in features for how you can deal with documents. You can index embedded documents. You can index keys inside keys, inside documents inside keys. You can have arrays. Can you have arrays in a JSON thing in Postgres? OK. Um, you can, can you do aggregations or search across? OK, so like MongoDB has the aggregation framework, which is like it's really rich way of querying the data. So we're trying to provide a feature that makes it so people don't necessarily have to use Hadoop. Or um, we also have a map for this, but that's kind of deprecated. We're focusing now on the aggregation framework. We have a really rich query language. Um, we have, uh, like, so anyway, I'll stop there. But <laughs> to answer your question, it's, that's kind of like, um, uh, it's, I understand from Postgres, this point of view that's um, responding to a certain need that people have, but it's very simple compared to what Kong has. It's not just a simple document. Okay. So anyone has any questions? <coughs> yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, I, I don't get it. <laughs> and that's not a question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The data I have been exposed to has all been relational in some yes. shape or form. Anyway, okay. so I just don't get why, what is it that you gain? Okay, I mean, that's, I, I'm not saying everybody should use MongoDB. I'm just curious if, like, that's fine. That's, I, I totally agree that there's some data that is relational, inherently relational, and you, why would you use another tool if right. everything's working out so far? So, so what are the things that it's good for then? I mean, what, what would be some example that really shines? Okay, um, who uses MongoDB again? What do you use it for? Why is it good for your use case? So in my use case, they were using MongoDB for <laughs> actual documents, so they were kind of, kind of mapping a, a workflow at a, a um, an office or a certain department, and then they switched to MySQL. Okay. And it doesn't make sense. They should have stuck with uh, MongoDB. Okay. They, they thought it's, and that's probably what we should talk about later, the mobile thing. They didn't get it, so they kind of got confused with mobile. Yeah. Instead of thinking in, da in, in document database uh, layers, and then they pitched it for MySQL, which was a mistake you know, right. in that particular use case. Okay, so the, the friction there was more that MongoDB didn't expose the the um, behavior of MongoDB enough so that they were kept too far from what's actually going on so that we didn't really know that. The thing is, I mean, like, do you think they would have stuck with MongoDB if Mongoid was more like documenty and not <laughs> relationally? <laughs> so the thing was, we had this, um, like, we had documents and those documents had envelopes. Like, you know, like, we, we kind of tried to model a physical file exchange from, like when I bring in five files to you, you sign them, you put some copies. So it's basically perfect for MongoDB in my opinion. I have no idea about MongoDB to be honest, but it's much more uh, logical to use yeah. a document, a database for documents. And then they used Mongo on top and tried to make it relational. And this is kind of where I am in the same, like, like uh, fusion picture <laughs> with Peter that I, I didn't understand. Because documents, MongoDB, relational stuff, yeah. Postgres, or whatever, and they, they were kind of doing Mongoid without thinking in a document-based right. mindset, okay. and, and that's kind of, this is exactly why I'm also confused with the program. Right. Since some things are so similar to Active Record on Mongoid, mm -hmm. with other relationships and so on, people usually take an approach that they try to build that relationship. Yeah. database uh, exactly. out of Mongo. Yeah. So I think the real problem here is to focus what what Mongo is or what Mongo is good for. Right. And that's that, that's a problem most people fall in. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing, like I uh, um, philosophically with Mongoid, I I would love to make it more 
of umami beef flavor, but at the same time, I'm afraid that that would alienate a lot of users and also make the transition from a relational database. Yeah. The learning curve would just be way too high. I'm, I'm not saying there's a problem. I think it's the, the relational model is too embedded in our minds nowadays, yeah. and we yeah. try to grab Mongo and yeah. make it a relational database. Yeah. Not good for that. Do you think if I made an ODM that was not like Active Record, it would like maybe the buried entry would be bigger or or yeah, more difficult? Yeah. But then once you're there, you get it more. Is that maybe some good examples? Then you know proper use cases where the document-based approach fits in better would be great. Like something you know. Complex example: How do I use MongoDB properly so we understand? Okay, this is actually what I'm looking for. Okay. <clears throat> Instead of trying to, you know, this is like a blog post and use a blog, and I can have a blog post right. and you know, this kind of stuff. Okay. Um, so are you asking me to do that right now, or do you think that like, <laughs> like yeah, do you think yeah. if I like um, provided a sample app that that everybody knew about that showed like a really good, really interesting wrench example of how it can be used well, would that be like useful? Because I know like blog posts. Maybe like, some cookbook with you know recipes where you can pick I mean I'm saying this and I should write this for my own stuff as well. Yeah. <laughs> you mean so, I write a cookbook of like <laughs> different apps. So, like a cookbook, you know we, we show like for example the, the case we have um, with the files in the in the envelope and this kind of stuff and then you just quickly like some diagram, diagrams always work with people. Yeah. You know, and then you kind of some people get the idea of document based studies because I don't I, I don't get it. Like right. I, okay. Well Mong I don't know if everybody's aware that MongoDB has um the URL is MongoDB EU. Oh, sorry. Yeah. MongoDB EU. EDU, is that what it is? MongoDB University. Yeah, that's right. And we have these amazing courses and they're so popular. We've like hired people who have done really well. Um University. It's so if you're, um, I've not taken these courses, um, obviously. Um, but we have, uh, so we have some like basics, diagnostics and debugging, performance um, in .NET, in Node.js, in um, I know in Python also. Python somewhere. Um, oh, I'm not sure. What <laughs> well, actually, hang on. Let me just, just close my like, eyes. Close. <laughs> okay, I'm good. Is that a Is that a position? 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 I'm an engineer, so I'm not very good at the sales part of MongoDB, if you can probably tell. Um, but like, I know we have a lot of resources for people who are curious about it, and um, also people who are knowledgeable, knowledgeable about it. Um, so it's all this stuff. So if you want to check it out, and um, I think this, the features of the database make you understand more why people want to use it. So I actually use Mongo University. And a lot of it was more operational and how do you do this, how do you do that. Yeah. There wasn't much on how do you architect your data structures to fit Mongo's use okay. case versus Postgres and MySQL. So could you share a bit on how would you like how would you structure the data structures within MongoDB as compared to a traditional relational database? Okay. Um we use a blog example, just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, so I think I think one of the the main, I, when I first started MongoDB five years ago, we were a very small company, we were like 50 or 60 people, and now we're like 700, 750. So engineers did everything, and I did um, a lot of presentations on schema design. And one of the things I would say over and over again, this is five years ago also, so obviously the database has grown up a lot in the last five years, is that what's different about MongoDB, you're, uh, you're talking about schema and the structure, yeah. So the, what's different about modeling your data with MongoDB is your data is modeled in the database much more closely to how it's actually presented or used in your application. So um, this is an oversimplified example also, but if you were, if you were building an app that was a bookstore like Amazon or something,
and every book you showed in your app or, or used, worked with in your app um, always had the author information or display the author information. You would um, you would maybe put uh, the author information as an embedded document inside the book document, so that when you loaded a page, all of the information you need on that one page could potentially be served by one database card. Um, and because we don't have joints, so. Um, when you think about your schema with MongoDB, you think more about your usage of the data, the um, what is going to change, what isn't going to change. So like a book's authors, the author probably isn't going to change. The name isn't going to change. It's a person. They have a certain birthday. And so things that don't change like that, they're, they're safe, safe to be in embedded documents inside a book and then maybe have um, the author document be represented as well in another collection, but you have um, maybe some duplication, and that's okay because what you get, the advantage is like a minuscule amount of du duplication, and the advantage is that you reduce your database queries, and you can index on these embedded documents as well. So, um, so as a general, it's hard to like, talk about it without a lot of examples, but I know like in general the mindset is a little different because you have to be a little more comfortable with your data not being so like perfectly like square all over the place. You kind of like push things together and mold the the, the representation of the data to be more closely related or closely representative of how you actually use that data. And it's it's uncomfortable for people who have been working with relational databases for so long. You're so used to to favoring um, data integrity or like um, being concerned about transactions. Normalization. Yeah. Yeah. Is that answer? <laughs> so the point of normally the schema structure is to have redundancy. Like you want to have this. I'm totally fine with that. Like if your example said like the author's birthday or something is not going to change. So you, you want that redundancy. Just in case this author has two books, and you would have an author copy one. Is it just a reference, or how do you? I I wouldn't say that the the approach itself or the goal itself is to have redundancy. I I what I'm saying is if redundancy is a side effect of making <coughs> modeling your data in this way, that's usually okay, or that's something that you can you can do and make work for your application. So if you have author information repeated on, do, on book documents, you could also have um, like a callback on the author that, <laughs> that if the author data changes, you can like update it or something. But like how often is the author data gonna change? Like whose name changes? But if it was to change, let's say I marry and then my last name changes and I have like 15 books, which I do not have by the way. Um, would I have to go through all the books like, is there like a MongoDB API to change that, or how do you model that? Uh, yeah, you could. I mean, there's you can do an update on on books. Like you could say, our update update operation takes a query and the update um, predicate. So you could have a query in your books collection that says where author ID matches X or author name matches X update. So why? So you can do update many. Um, it's like we have crud, just like. Yeah, but then, but then how does how does Mongoid do that? Because I think Mongoid will say book has one author or something like that. I'm just guessing. And then if I update the book's author, Mongoid will translate that into the query you were just describing. The select book where all the name equals blah 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 and update name. So first. One question, are you going to read that Ruby Hub? Yes. Okay, so I'm talking about this in my, my talk, so you'll see exactly how all of the relations work in Mongoid. Um, but but I kind of, kind of, um, Mongoid has two types of relations. One is reference and one is embedded. Reference functions exactly like MySQL or relational re uh, relationships where there's a foreign key saved on documents. and it has has many belongs to hasn't belongs to many um, has one that's it um, and then the embedded relations are embeds many so it's an array of embedded documents embeds one 
in, and embedded in. And then cyclic embedded, which is like you have a tree and it just keeps going. Um, so to answer your question, what, how Mongoid would handle that relation, the relationship and update the documents depends on how you define the relationship. If it's, uh, if it's book, if a, in this case it'd be has and belongs to many. Because a book could have many authors and an author could have many books, and then in that case, both sides save an array of IDs, and there's no join table. That's a, actually, that's a difference between. So there's, there's no join table, there's, the book keeps an array of IDs, so that's by reference, then that's yeah. embedded, right? Yeah, okay. and then authors have a list of IDs and books. I, I already know what people want to ask. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, so, so what, I, what it sounds like you're saying is that that, that lends itself to a scenario where you have uh, a massive overrepresentation of reads, right? Because in the hypothetical case where where Nick gets married and changes his family name, that happens once, but that book gets presented like millions of times every day. So that's why you don't want to have to do that additional table to look up in order to fix the author name. Is that what it is? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, you're right. saying so you're saying if he updates his no, so I'm saying the, the fact that he opted out this, he changes his name. Yeah. And that happens very, very rarely. And you don't care about the fact that you have to go through additional books yeah. in order to update it everywhere else. Yeah. Because this stuff is being read so many more times than it's being written. Right. So that's why you want to have that advantage of keeping all the data together so you can do one query. Yeah. So is that what it is? that's what it's good for these, these you know, very read heavy yeah. use cases? Or you can think about it as a data that is immutable, but quasi immutable right. um, is a good idea. But it, not, to say, not that everything that's immutable should be normalized. It's like if it is, then it's a strong candidate to be normalized. Um, you definitely don't want to do that if it's going to get some data very often. Sure. Um, we share another use case for MongoDB. Sure. So we use that at our company. It's a, in the previous product, it was a location analytics product. So very briefly, the model could be something like a, a venue, as many devices, the device has many locations. The interesting thing is um, we found that in that specific use case, MongoDB suited our model because all the locations will come together within a certain time frame. For example, within one hour. There's no point getting one location that 30 minute and linking it with something else. So in terms of uh, data that comes coupled together, it actually makes sense to put it into a nested document model because then you don't have to do any joins and you just take a chunk of data and then it's all there and you can do whatever you want with it. And that made more sense for us in that use case where we had to do aggregation. So if you imagine like a document is just like a, a record, it has a um, readings, locations every um, 5 seconds for let's say 15 minutes and if you have to do like what, what they call a slice and dice analytics like bin it like every um, I don't know, every every 30 minutes or something like that then MongoDB's aggregation framework made it very easy for us to both read and do the in database aggregation for free so that's maybe not the same as the data modeling but the aggregation comes free with it and in that case it gave us a, uh, it saved us a lot of time in like modeling this because we actually didn't know how we were going to analyze it later so we just put data that should belong together in the same place mm -hmm. and then uh, it could just go together and get updated together yeah, that kind. yeah so that's a really good point that's, that's a point I don't think I made very strongly either is that you your schema is flexible, so you don't have migrations. If you have, if you want to add a field to a document, you can just add it, and um, and you can check if that field exists in the document in your query. So um, you're not gonna like you can you have a rich query language. So if you add these fields, you can also like select documents that don't have this field or do have this field. Um, and that's, I think, a big advantage for people as they're developing, um, especially with agile development practices, because you don't have to know everything up front. Yeah. You can adapt your application as you work on it. And that functionality actually helps a lot with big data. So I was saying previously in a startup that converted big data to PowerPoint slides. So they took a lot of advertising data from different advertising agencies like Facebook, Google, and all that. 
and then Google will like one month will be like, oh, we have this new key, right? And then the next one will be like, oh, this key is so on. So that allows us to update really fast without much more changes from the developer side. So that was really good for developer productivity. Right, and the fact it was document based allowed us to shard much earlier as compared to if it was relational based, right? So if it was relational based, we would now be figuring out with the joints across all the databases and ourselves. Whereas MongoDB provided that Mongo S layer that did all the sharding stuff for us automatically, although we still have to kind of know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so basically, uh, like for anybody who uses it, like, when you said that you use MongoDB, did you start with MongoDB or did you start with the relational database and tra uh, transition to Mongo or something? Because I'm not going. Really so from my understanding, I joined the company after they've already used MongoDB. Mm. And I found that uh, it's a good fit for the data model. I'm not sure if they started with something else, but when I looked at the analytics that they were trying to do, um, it kind of fits quite well because uh, it makes the conceptual understanding very easy. So if I were to say, what if I were to imagine implementing these functionalities in a relational database, then the red flag would be a lot, a lot of joints. But the world is not just relational and mongo DB. Yeah, that's true. So once, it sounds like, oh, if the schema is dynamic, I haven't figured it out yet, mongo may be good, I don't know, may be good. So after I figure it out, does it mean I transition to Cassandra? Or I'm serious database. Oh, I, I got this. It's not going to be like that. I, in, in our case, it's actually even more. Uh, well, it actually became uh, documents, actual documents stored in page base. You know, big data, data store. When we had to scale larger, but that's if we actually uh, wanted to run very large applications over a very long period of time. Which comes back to one of the things I wanted to ask. Uh, there are limitations around the aggregation framework and the document size. I guess that's for good reason for performance. So to us, we actually found that there was a certain point when our data became very large or very complex, that the aggregation framework kind of didn't really meet our needs. It was timing out and stuff like that. So Do you mean the result size or the, the size, size of the, 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 the temporary uh, documents? Okay. I don't remember what the limit is for that exactly, but I'm sure it's getting bigger. That's fine it's because amazing. at that point we had the luxury to then figure out that oh we need a different way of thinking how of how we do our ETM yeah. and stuff like that. Which is fine. Well, MongoDB serve our purposes for what it was good for and what yeah. we needed to do, and then we move on to something else. I think we can also now do um, it's where you split. It's kind of like a Unix pipe. Um, I think where you can split off in the middle of your aggregation, and it, are you on the latest version? Okay, because I think in three four you can do something like that to help with this. But even when you split, the whole thing is still stored in memory, so you can output to a cloud. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh yes. And you can return a cursor also yes. because originally it was limited by. Yes, I require that. Yeah. I have a comment. Sure. <laughs> so uh, to me, it sounds like, uh, to me, MongoDB sounds more and more interesting within the last 20 years. Yeah, so it sounds like it's a really good. Yes. Great. Is it recording? Want to turn the camera that way? <laughs> so uh, the thing is, I use um, a relational Postgres with the JSB columns. And I think, because I kind of need some little bit of um, um, relational stuff, but I actually enjoy the, I just chuck in data and I think about what to do and how to read it later. But that's basically what MongoDB kind of seems to be way better at as compared to Postgres. But here's the problem. You were asking why is it not popular in Ruby? And the problem is we all come from Rails and we think in database tables because the database table is our model and that's what is supposed to put all the code. Right. And that doesn't fit with the MongoDB thinking. Not at all, because the Mongo thinking is more like, here's a document, chuck in some stuff, and here are my objects that work with that document. And that doesn't work with the traditional Rails way thinking. So that's kind of where you have the, the barrier you have to break because people in Rails are obsessed with models. Equal database table. I'm also fighting trying to fight this this thinking, but that's the problem. That's why people don't use it wrongly, and those who use it use it the wrong way. 
Yeah. Probably. And that's kind of creating the wrong impression. Right. That's exactly why I'm sitting here <laughs> <laughs> with this microphone in my hand. Uh, yes, that's that's my that's my stay up late at night thinking about this. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Along the same question, does it is it ever a valid use case to have both Postgres or any other version of database together with Mongo? I think I've heard of people doing that. Um, I mean, I think there, in a Rails application, you can have uh, different databases serving different purposes. And I, one of my good friends in Berlin, I know his application does that. And um, if, if like, I, I don't necessarily think that MongoDB be, will um, determine whether the answer to that question is yes or no. I think it's more like what your use case is. If you find that you have some very specific area of your application that is really good for MongoDB or MongoDB is really good for it, and something else that definitely needs to be relational, um, then that's if that works for you. Then um, that's I think it's totally possible for people doing it. So at the previous company I was at, right, uh, all our big data stuff was in MongoDB, whereas all our, uh, our client data was in Postgres itself. So it's perfectly normal to have it across the because you use it for the right purpose, right? I think that should be how Mongo position is now. Oh. It should be the Redis in the real app, yeah. not the active, like, I, I cannot move my huh. user permission. Companies belongs to many, and I'm not going to move that out. Yeah. <laughs> Relationship data. And which goes back to your first point, should Mongo continue that active record? Think or go its own way. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, I think, like, um, for everybody here, like, probably one of the first five tables that you create is like user, and I, I just don't see how that's not relational. I mean, it's, it's possible that you have a user model, or user table in the database, and it's not relational to other users, or or even something like a blog post or movies or whatever primary has many things that user has is relational. So I guess um. I'm trying to compare it with Redis, and for Redis, uh, the logical thing is that at first you use it for things like uh, the, uh, like a delete job, or sorry, rescue, or something like a cache. But for Mongo, how do you, uh, I guess if I was in Mongo's position, I would try to position it in such a way that, okay, you can use Mongo for this, but you have to keep your relational database because everybody starts off thinking with uh, any user object, or uh, I don't know, like whatever. I, I have a question. If you have a user object with a relational database and you have phone numbers for that user, do you save them in another table? Uh, How do you save phone numbers? At the start, for for me, I try to start like just on the table itself and it expands. I mean, you, you start, I mean, can you have like multiple phone numbers? Mm -hmm. I, because you can't have an array, right? Yes, yes. So you just have multiple. You have like phone number one, phone number two. Uh, yes, I'm not sure for other people, but I guess for at that very, very start, you start off with just one. Then yeah. I mean, there I think they should have yeah. used as many phone numbers or something like that. Yeah. So, or you can use a JSON thing. Because like but, when I think of a user, I think for me, I think obviously, I mean, I'm, um, I've been thinking in MongoDB for so long that it's the natural thing for me, but. I think a user in MongoDB makes so much more sense to me because you can just have an array of phone numbers or an array of documents that are addresses. Because like, how many of us only have one address? We have like shipping address, and home address, and whatever. So for me, it's just you have this rich document because you don't want to have a table of addresses like where it's just like because you're the only one living there. Usually, I mean, with maybe some other people, but you know. So, um, but I. So I, if I understand what you're saying, though, um, you think that that there might be there might it might be interesting to think of, of a strong default uh, use case for MongoDB, so that like when people think like that, they think it becomes the the obvious like MongoDB becomes the obvious choice for this type of model. Because what you're what it sounds like you're saying is that most of the objects we think about when we're using Rails are already represented relationally. So we immediately think of a relational database. Like a mindset in all the examples is relational. Yeah, actually, while well, you were speaking, I thought that, yeah, it does make sense. Uh, I mean, um, I think if you ask, I don't, I'm not sure with this, but I think if you ask 
in uh, the the programmer. Some some would make the the, the address like a, like the field, like city, country, whatever for, for a user. Or they make they may make it like a JSON hasher, or they oh, may make it into like another table and like, normalize it. So I guess for uh, just just thinking out that I have like zero experience with Mongo, but if was probably in Mongo's position and wanted to position it in such a way that it would make sense. Probably just the narrative people that oh instead of thinking what to do we we have this solution that would right. work better mm -hmm. that makes sense like yeah um, but I guess like the reasonable default for Rails is using relational database then um, maybe uh, add add Mongo at some point yeah yeah I think that was what Nick was getting to about those that cookbook right yeah. yeah. Wait, wait, were you saying create an app as a cookbook or creating a cookbook is kind of like a, yeah, like a, a resource? Yeah. You know, like this is the problem, here's a free solution, this is the problem. Okay. Like the phone numbers, a yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. that makes people understand the, the natural, organic way of MongoDB as compared yeah. to like relational. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. <laughs> so, if you want to see more MongoDB like objects, you can try the Fosco API. So I'm not sure if they use Mongo, but the uh, JSON of this group has like how I was calling Mongo. Yeah, they took never they use it. They're like our poster channel. So that explains a lot. Yeah. Can <laughs> yeah, yeah. you show some uh, quick example of how to use Mongo without Mongo in Ruby? Um, like with the driver? <laughs> you just maybe just the GitHub readme or something so, like, oh. so so we can see some like <coughs> Uh, sure. Because I, I, I don't understand how you success. Sorry. Okay. Wait. Should I just check the speaker? Yep. Okay, so this is the reader. So you want to see how to work with. I'd say the uh, user with phone numbers. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. 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 This is the driver that I was working on today. So, uh, yeah, so um, this is the driver. Um, the, there are no models here. It's just Ruby hashes and then operations on the database. Um, I don't know why this is. Hashes to the BSUN data type. And then the driver is in the middle of those of, of the abstraction of Mongoid and the BSUN gem. So what I'm doing, what I'm using now is the client. The, it's kind of like the connection object in Active Record. So it's um, pure operations to the database, and the um, the only objects I work with are hashes, and the hashes represent it's a one-to-one -one mapping basically of hashes to MongoDB documents. So I'm going to create a client. <coughs> um, so the this is the client. It's um, logging that it connected to a single server. Um, part of one of the major parts and responsibility of the driver, what makes the code a bit opaque and complex is that with MongoDB we have uh, replica sets and sharded clusters. Um, replica sets are what they sound like. It's where you have a single primary node uh, server and secondary that replicate from that primary automatically and you set this up. Uh, we have a, now um, many ways to set it up but you can set it up manually as well. And the, the client's job is to keep track of what servers are in the replica set. In this case, I only have one standalone. That's why it says topology type uh, change to single. Um, but if you have a replica set, all these messages will be 
more descriptive in that I'll say like discovered this server is a secondary, this server is a primary, and then we have failover, so if the primary goes down, a secondary will step in, you'll see that all logged by the client. Um, so then if I want to, um, the client object is, as I said, a connection to the database, in this case I'm only talking to a single node, a, a standalone, um, and the client has uh, a connection to a single database at, at a time. So right now it's connected to admin by default, but I can say, um, I can create a new client, say uh, test, oh, uh, database, oh wait, right, right, sorry. <laughs> so now I had to create a, So now I'm connected to another database called test, and then the syntax for accessing a collection is like this. Let's call it test collection. So that's a collection. Um, so now that we have this collection object, um, I'll insert a document. And it's really simple, you just use the Ruby hash, so um, well, let's do like a bridge. So that, this is a hash, and I'm saying insert one, and you'll see the operation. Um, it does an insert into the test database, into the test collection, and then this is the document set of inserts. So I can do an insert one, I can do an insert many, and then I would provide an array of my brother. Um, 
Oh yeah, cap yeah, yeah. Cap collection is a cap collection. It's a collection of a fixed size, and um, as you insert data into it, once it reaches that max size, it loops around and inserts. So it's, um, it has some use cases. Like we actually use it internally for the offlog. So if you have a replica set, the members of the replica set have a capped collection that saves all of the writes that they're that they um, that they're recording from the primary and applying to themselves. Like a time series database type thing. Yeah, if you're familiar with, um, I think Rethink DB has something like that. Um, yeah, we, we hired someone recently who went on that last company or worked on uh, telling the yes. What is uh, the grid thing? Like, is it for files that they didn't understand when you were saying? Yeah, it's for it's so files and others. Yeah, it's um, on any of these document size, it's oh. limited at 16 megabytes. So you have some, if you have some, 16 megabytes. 16? Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you have a file that's larger than that that you'd like to save in the database, it's um, GridFS is a convention, that's what I was looking for before, a convention that all of the drivers implement for saving files. So that um, you can save you can save data that's larger than 16 megabytes. Um, so you you pass the file name to the root file or you, and then it yeah. grabs the real file out of the world. Yeah, so the, something we like, like <laughs> when we first wrote the driver probably too much detail, but we, we kind of have like two APIs for the for FS, but there's one that's favored that is the official API. And it works on this idea of streams. So you would open an upload stream like this and give it a file name, and then you would write the file like this. This is this is the preferred API. But when we originally released the driver, um, I rewrote it with Duran like two or three years ago. We didn't have the convention documented across all drivers, so we just kind of implemented GridFS how we thought it should be implemented. But then the driver team got together and wrote specifications for how it should work. So that's why we have kind of two APIs. Um, but the favored one is uh, the one that uses streams. You would open a upload stream and then write to it. And then um, this is how you would download the, the file. So you would normally, I don't know, like create this user with phone numbers and then, for example, upload the passport or something in a separate operation. Oh, I mean, because here you got the, uh, you know, in your example of the shell? Yeah. You have this, um, I don't know, um, new or whatever we, what, what, insert key. Yeah. So you insert, I don't know, because there's like two different APIs right now. The grid FS API is not integrated into the insert API. Or grid FS uses the insert API internally. So I could use, I could insert everything in one. Oh, okay, you know, phone numbers and uh, and also the passport scan or something like that? Um, not in the same operation. If you're okay. inserting a file, you use GridFS. If you're inserting a document, you use... But normally, you're going to Mongoid anyway. So, Mon you, well, I, not really, but not necessarily. But if you're working with these these objects, you probably would have would work okay. with a Mongoid. Because I'm trying to find a simple way for a small files and uh, I don't want to use uh, Amazon or something, I just want to, it's, it's not like I'm going to have 64 gigabytes or something, it's just about a couple of right. megabytes, so this looks like a convenient uh, way. Could you convert a photo into a binary string and store it inside? Yeah. Yeah. Curtis has... Go so uh, into the document, the user document. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, um, there's a Python type called uh, binary. Um, these are the types. So we have a binary, which is binary data. And I don't have a piece on it. But there are different types for the binary. This is the, um, this is a piece on Java I was mentioning. So the, these are the types for the binary. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think we're out of time, right? Yeah. As long as 15 minutes. <laughs> I think it's good. There's a lot of interest. And yeah. So maybe one direction might be the advocacy side. 
that in terms of books, examples, mm -hmm. even potentially workshops, yeah. was my own biased um, experience was that when I started looking at MongoDB, I really had to question how I want to design my schema, what to agree yeah. and what to refer. Yeah. Obviously, in my limited experience with uh, relational uh, databases, it's mostly just foreign keys and depth joints. Yeah. But this made me think a lot more. I yeah. actually like that learning experience. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is really helpful. And if anybody wants to email me or whatever, like just give me more, more information. It's, um, it's really helpful for me. Um, and if you want to do like a video chat like I did today, it's like really uh, a huge source of information for me. It's really useful. So otherwise, I'm just writing code, you know, in like a vacuum. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.